Hello, my dog lovers. Hello, we are live. I have to confess, the reason why I'm late is that just about five minutes before I sat down and started broadcasting, I set everything up, I was all ready, and um, suddenly my microphone knocked down my computer, and the computer knocked down my cup with tea and water, and the computer screen broke, and uh, the room was flooded. <laughs> so, um, it is just the way it is, and I'm I'm so glad I'm here, even though I feel like I, I should go and do some meditation and yoga. Hi, Alicia. Hi, Hello. it's been a, a lively start to the session, but all is well now. Alicia saw it all, it all tumbled down, and you know, like, oh my goodness, like when it happens, we were so, I'm so pissed off at myself. <laughs> Couldn't I be more careful? Anyway, that's just how it is. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we are going to have a lot of fun today, it seems. Uh, we are going to talk about Giardia, which is neither plant, neither animal. It's protozoa. And in the past, protozoa have been put in the category of animals, kind of animals that have only one cell. But then because they act like animals, they kind of, they, they act predatory and they infest and, and, um, and enter our bodies and try to wreak havoc. Actually, most of the time they don't, but sometimes they do. And today we'll be talking about Giardia and Giardia is um, a, a causing or causes a disease that many of you call beaver fever. And I know that some people are really worried about beaver fever. I like the I like the name. I like it much more than Giardiasis uh, because it just <laughs> it's fun. Um, you know, every time I walk in the mountains and I walk with other people, even if we are in the high alpine where the water is super clean and probably better than any tap water that we can drink, people are so worried about Giardia. And today I'd like to put a little bit more shed a little bit more light on Giardia and how it's treated, how it's diagnosed, what is usually being done and why some of the methods don't need to be used and how often it is treated when it doesn't need to be treated. So um, it'll be a good <laughs> weapon in your arsenal um, in case your dog is diagnosed with Giardia. So the first question and, and the question that most people ask is, how dangerous is Giardia? And what to do when your dog is positive? Now, I prepared some really beautiful pictures. Like, I don't really know whether you think this is beautiful. I think it's beautiful, especially because this is one cell organism. Uh, nature is amazing. Uh, for, <laughs> for decades now, we've been trying to create these drones and different microorganisms and nanotechnology, and we already have it in nature. Uh, these are little micro drones. Um, the Giardia is, a, as I said, protozoa. It doesn't have cell wall the same way plants do, but it is composed basically of one cell with two nuclei meaning that here is one and there is another one. And it is also eight little whips or flagellae in Latin. And the Giardia basically moves. This is one cell, this is kind of crazy. It moves by waving the flags and propels around. Plus it has two suction cups that can attach to the intestinal wall. Kind of fantastic, right? And it propagates itself by dividing. So imagine if you, you know, when you look at your husband, if, if your husband was Giardia or wife or partner, um, imagine that suddenly, you know, they would just split in two. What a horror, right? <laughs> but that's what Giardia does. The, the wife Giardia kind of looks at her husband Giardia and suddenly there's two husbands, right? And, you know, it's a problem. Um, so just remember, that Giardia is a protozoa and it's, it's, it has eight flags. And the trophozoite actually 
it's kind of like a wallflower. It's very sensitive. It's very fragile. It doesn't really like to be exposed to sun and, and UV light and the external elements. So it actually lives only in the intestinal tract. And when Giardi decides it's time to go for a little trip, it actually turns into a cyst. And there is four of those inside. I have no idea how, you know, it could be a little, um, um, basically there's four, four uh, nuclei with those little fla flags or flagellae or flagella, flagellas. <laughs> I don't really know whether to mix Latin with English or just use English endings, but anyway. So the cyst is much more resistant. See it as, a, as the capsule were that, that Richard Branson just recently, no, it was actually Jeff Bezos that had capsule, just recently shot himself in the space with uh, an old grandma and astronaut and uh, his brother and another student. So, and there were four, four of them too, right? So. Maybe we should call the capsule the, the capsule from Amazon, Giardia capsule. Um, anyway, so it's very resistant to the, the external um, elements and uh, it can be shot out of the poop chute and out in the unknown and it survives. So there are two different kinds of or forms of the parasite. And I guess the next thing that I, should talk about is how the infection happens. I'll talk about how dangerous it is and all that stuff, but infection happens by people or animals ingesting the cyst. And the cyst actually is kind of helpful, the capsule, not only for space flight, but also for flight into the stomach and the intestinal tract, because the, the stomach acids would probably destroy the, the, the very fine and fragile trophozoite, but it does not destroy the cyst. So it gets through the stomach and settles down usually in the small intestine. It can be also found in the large intestine, but most of the time it actually likes the small intestine because it's perfect environment for Giardia to get a lot of food, a lot of nutrients and split up and multiply and multiply a lot if the right conditions are there. And remember, Giardia proliferates or multiplies only if the right conditions are present. And your goal with your dog will be to make the conditions not as favorable to Giardia. That's the most important goal. So, um, you know, Many people ask, um, can GRD be transferred from dogs to humans and vice versa? And recent research suggests that that is not very common, which is actually good for your dog, good for you. Um, also, people ask, how serious is GRD? And to be honest, it is only serious in animals that are predisposed to GRD infection. Um, one third of dogs out there and, you know, one third of your dogs who are watching have Giardia in the body, in the system without really showing any symptoms and without you showing any symptoms. And many parasites are basically opportunists. They are kept at bay. Even pathologic bacteria can be kept at bay if there are not too many. But if the favorable conditions arise, let's say inflammation of the gut, poor diet, too much sugar or starch, then they start multiplying. If the microbiome, if the healthy bacteria is not um, present in sufficient numbers, that's another condition. So, you know, giardiasis is not, or giardia is not really dangerous and serious in most dogs because, you know, your dog may have it and you don't even know. And it often happens that it's found on the lab uh, fecal examination. And then your vet calls you and says, your dog needs to be treated. But it is not exactly the case. It is not exactly true. And I will explain that in a moment. But before I do that, I'd like to show you what the acute form of Giardia, when it causes diarrhea, actually looks like or does. So I'm going to share screen again. 
and I'm getting some messages from my computer. Don't spill tea on me. <laughs> That's the message. Uh, all right. Um, so Giardia causes the intestinal villi, which is um, the little serrated surface of the intestine. It causes them to flatten. So on the left side, you can see that the that uh, Dr. Tobias, sorry to interrupt. The what? share screen hasn't come up just yet. Oh no! I'm but we could see it before. Secret. I'm keeping it secret for you. Um, I got it. Thank you. So, um, Giardia flattens this the little surface of the small intestine, and uh, I will show you the phases actually on another slide. You can see this is actually normal surface of the intestinal loops. That's microscopic, okay? So you can see these ridges, these valleys, these canyons. And then when Giardia actually starts multiplying in high numbers, then the villi actually flatten to the point where they're really eroded. And that's when absorption of nutrients and minerals uh, is altered. Uh, that's when diarrhea happens, that, that's when water absorption actually is altered as well and disrupted. And um, the, the parasite, when someone who knows what they're looking for, looks at the, at the microscope, the parasite looks sometimes like a little leaf that is falling. And even if you're looking at the microscope and the trophozoid is actually alive, it looks like it's kind of falling through like a little leaf in the fall. You can see the trophozoites right here on the left side, and you can see them also here. So, you know, for someone who doesn't really know what they're looking for, they go, okay, there's some sort of messy debris, but it's not, it's not really the case. I kind of like the greenish uh, staining of Giardia because it's actually a little nicer to see. And you can see the two nuclei. Obviously, it's not as beautiful as our picture up here, because this is an electron microscope. But if we look at these, this is a regular microscope and we are seeing pretty good, uh, pretty good um, outline of the parasite. So the interesting and curious thing is that microbiome has shown to be different in dogs with symptoms of Giardia. Microbiome is the probiotic bacteria in your gut. And research has confirmed that the probiotic bacteria or microbiome has a lot to do with whether your dog will or will not get infested. Now, if you ask your veterinarian to test your dog for Giardia and your dog does not have any symptoms of diarrhea, I'd say don't <laughs> because it is very possible that your veterinarian, as well-meaning as they are, will treat your dog with uh, metronidazole or fenbendazole, the two drugs that are used. And as you will learn later on today, it's not ideal. Also, remember that positive test does not mean that there is an actual acute disease or disease at all. Negative test does not rule out giardiosis. So, you know, if you look at it, it only makes sense to actually run giardia test when your dog has had ongoing diarrhea that doesn't respond to just regular diarrhea management. Um, and I'll talk about that too. So remember, if, if there's one thing that I'd like you to remember from today, positive test does not mean that there is disease that needs to be treated and negative test does not rule out giardiasis. There are several reasons for that. The test, there are several different tests. Some of them are uh, composed of a flotation test where you take a solution of a certain thickness and the parasite floats to the surface, then you collect the surface and you try to examine the surface layer of the solution and see whether you find giardia or falling leaves. Or there is another test, which I, <laughs> which I call the sandbox test. <laughs> you know, when kids actually play, play uh, cooks uh, in the sandbox, uh, they kind of mix the little sand and the water and they cook something. So that's what you do with the poop. You kind of mix it. And uh, 
I think that in veterinary terms or medical terms, it's called it's called vet wet mount test, which is much more fancy, but it's basically taking a piece of poop and mixing it like, like in the sandbox and then throwing it under a microscope. So uh, yeah, so there are several different tests. There's also ELISA or immunofluorescent test that uh, searches for the antigen for the parasite itself uh, through different methods, through, um, through um, a little more complex method, but uh, all of them, all of them can be positive or negative, but if your dog doesn't have symptoms, then it doesn't really matter much. So if your vet says, you know, your dog is positive for Giardia, we should put it on, on uh, antibiotics. Actually, the first question should be, has he had any diarrhea and how often, right? And if your dog does, hasn't had diarrhea for the last two weeks or month, or if he had diarrhea just once and then it was fine, most likely you will not need to treat. So, Let's look at the treatment uh, first. So if Giardia is positive with no symptoms, as I said, there is no need to use drugs. And what you need to do is optimize your dog's diet and support the gut. You know, it would be nice not to see any Giardia, right? But even the treatment with the drugs doesn't actually aim for eliminating Giardia. That may surprise you because you may think, okay, my dog got drugs. So, you know, the vet is aiming for getting rid of it. And that's how it often sounds. But in clinical circles and in research, we've discovered that GRD actually cannot be really easily treated with, with anything, right? Uh, so that's the trick. Um, if your dog is positive with acute symptoms that last only for days or weeks, I would not use drugs initially, and I would optimize your dog's diet and support the gut. Use drugs only if your dog does not get better. And you're probably wondering, so, you know, what, what do you want to do? Uh, what drugs uh, shall we not use and, and why? And what is the dietary support and gut support? So that's something that we are going to talk about next. There are two drugs, as I mentioned, um, that are used for Giardia treatment or support, I'm going to call it. One of them is metronidazole, and it's a very common anti-diarrheal drug. However, it doesn't come without price when it's used, and I will pay attention to it a little more in detail. I will actually share something with you. I, I have my other blog up here, and let me just see. I'm going to switch the screens because otherwise Alicia would tell me, Peter, we can see it. Um, so there has been a research study done on the effect of metronidazole. And uh, this is the study. You can look it up if you wish. Uh, we can also put the link um, up in the discussion. Um, I think that Paula or Christina is helping today, Alicia. Paula, Paula is helping in the Paula. background. Thank yes. you, Paula. <laughs> Paula is one of our main customer service um, team members uh, who answer your question if you need, need them to be answered. Anyway, so some daring folks um, were very brave to actually do study on the effect of metronidazole. You know how it is when someone tries to prove that drugs are not good, <laughs> not very good, right? <laughs> so these daring beings and colleagues have actually been able to uh, do a study on the effect of metronidazole. It's a very long study, but I will actually give you the summary of this um, right here. So what they've done, uh, they evaluated um, uh, dogs with diarrhea, and uh, also they evaluated um, the diversity of beneficial intestinal bacteria in, in three groups of dogs, and I'll explain what, what those groups were. They also affect, um, um, they also, um, examine the short chain fatty acids, which are really important for microbiome, and also the population of Clostridium perfrigens, which is, uh, which is a pathogenic bacteria. They also assess cobalamin folate levels, which are also another or other indicators of intestinal health. And they also um, 
assess bile acids, which are super important for digestion. And they're produced by the liver and the bile, but, or they're not produced by the bile, but they're in the bile. And also lactate, which is a sign of oxidative stress. And we don't want oxidation, oxidative stress be in our dogs and in our dog's gut. So the findings were that more than half of the dogs on metronidazole actually developed diarrhea two to three days after the start of the experiment. Okay, so that's an interesting one. Anti-diarrheal drug causes diarrhea. Great. Um, also, there was a significant decrease of the beneficial intestinal bacteria. And the microbiome actually has not, has not recovered for uh, fully um, in four weeks after discontinuing the drug. Another bad news, right? So it damages the microbiome long-term. It also reduced, um, decreased um, short chain fatty acids, which is not good for the microbiome and intestinal function. And um, it uh, didn't seem to decrease numbers of um, clostridia, which metronidazole is also <laughs> used for. But ironically, the clostridium hieron, hieron, hiero, hi, how do you, hieronones, how about that? I'm gonna pronounce it in Latin. Um, was, uh, was actually decreased. So the positive bacteria decreased and the negative bacteria wasn't affected. Not a very good resume, right? Um, then um, it also um, affected uh, vitamins and uh, nucleobases, which are vital components of DNA and RNA. The bile acid levels have decreased, again, affected digestion and negatively. And lactate levels increase and, and oxidation stress also, oxidative stress also uh, increased. So when you look at metrodidazole and the fact that it's been used for dogs with diarrhea, I do not think that this is some, this is a drug that I would hire if I was hiring for <laughs> hiring a drug for treating diarrhea, right? If a drug was a person. And uh, so this is kind of an irony in medicine. Uh, I think. You guys, it happens. These things happen because someone introduces a drug, usually a drug company. Then they tell us how amazing it is. Then we start believing it. Then it becomes a very common routine practice. And then we don't look back. Then we don't look at the studies. Then we don't look at the side effects, mainly because we get too busy and we get too routine oriented. And we are not curious enough to actually see if what we are doing is actually okay. So it kind of puts metronidazole on my bad friends list, to be honest. Now, when we look at fenbendazole, I don't have a study on fenbendazole, but if you go into um, the side effects that are listed with fenbendazole, it includes the following. And I'm gonna share this slide again, if you wanna take a screenshot. Fenbendazole includes, or side effects um, are liver disease, diarrhea, and bone marrow suppression. Bone marrow suppression is kind of dangerous for wanting our dogs to be strong on the immune level, right? So not the greatest drug to be used. It is possibly a better drug out of those two to use for Giardia if you see that your dog has been suffering from Giardia and nothing else works but there is a lot of something else. And I want to talk to you about what can be used and what can be done. So um, let's look at diet. If you are thinking that you can prevent acute diarrhea caused by Giardia by feeding your dog kibble, forget it. It is as if you were complaining about your tires getting flat and had a garage full of nails. I know that some of you, and I talk about it often, I don't want you to feel bad about feeding kibble because you've been taught, taught to do that, or maybe it's less expensive, or maybe you just are worried about bacteria and the raw diet and cooked food, whatever it is, I understand. But I've been feeding raw diet for the last 25 years. And I can tell you honestly that not only dogs live about 25% plus years longer, they're also healthier, they're stronger, 
they're less inflamed, they get less cancer, they move better, they are so much better overall. And nobody really <laughs> is surprised when we go to, let's say safari or zoo, I don't like zoos, but if you go to zoos, that a lion eats meat or wolf eats a rabbit. But we are really surprised when someone says that dogs should, or some people are still surprised that dogs should eat raw food. They have digestive tract that is well built for the bacteria to handle, and it's much less risky than feeding food that is species inappropriate. Now, it is very clear that doctors, human doctors, have been on board with um, natural food for a long time. They're telling us, do not eat processed food, do not eat McDonald's, do not eat, um, you know, try to stay on the periphery of the grocery store. And in veterinary profession, it's still not the case. I know that your dog is less likely to have Giardia acute problems if he or she is on raw or cooked food. If you have problems with your dog having diarrhea, I urge you to do that. Remember, if you don't want to have flat tires, you vacuum your garage floor and get rid of the nails. If you don't want your dog to have diarrhea, you have to get rid of potential partial cause. Because what it does actually, it disturbs the microbiome. If a food, food sits on the shelf for six months, 12 months and longer, it actually is rancid. It also is full of ingredients that are not species appropriate, uh, like grain and, and, you know, and, and a lot of render ingredients and ingredients that are not really supposed to be in food, like cellulose, you know, <laughs> wood shavings basically are in, in many of these brands. And even if the food was the best in, made of the best ingredients, if you feed processed food for a long time, the digestive tract will get stressed. I am not big fan of dehydrated food for long term. If you go camping or something like that, or if you travel with your dog, it's fine for a few days. But if you're feeding your dog dehydrated food on a going basis, two things happen. Your dog will probably overeat because it's much more calorie dense. Um, and if he or she doesn't, then it still puts extra strain on the digestive tract, which will make inflammation more likely and giardiasis, giardiasis oh my goodness, that's a word for me, um, is more likely to happen. So uh, let's go back to the slides. I realized that I did not um, share the tire. Did I share the tire, Alicia? Have you seen? Yes, you seen I've seen the tire. the tire with the nails. I took extra yes. pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you do when your dog is Akidaria? Um, that's the first thing that we are going to talk. Um, if, he, if your dog has positive tests for Giardia, there are two steps or two phases of this. The first thing that you do is to fast your dog for 12 to 24 hours. I, I wrote it down here because I want you to take a screenshot, keep it in your computer, print it out so you know what to do. It's also on our website if you go to a blog on diarrhea. Uh, anyway, you have to fast first and don't be afraid to fast your dog. Don't worry about fasting your dog. Dogs are natural fasters. Plus, if you fast your dog even on a regular basis, once a week, um, it actually activates certain enzymes which are known to be um, part of longevity and expression of longevity. So if you fast your dog and express them to a certain degree of small stress, light stress, it actually is good for longevity. And that research has been done. Um, when the fast is over, cook squash and use a little bit of chicken broth or other meat broth, make porridge and Vitamix or other blender, and feed it to your dog once a day for a day or two days. After that, you can cook meat and add a little more vegetables, maybe use the squash or pumpkin for one more, one more meal. But by then, your dog should be fine. Keep your dog really well hydrated, meaning that you should be putting enough chicken broth in the mixture or add some water as well. Make sure that your dog has water as well. Again, make sure that your dog gets filtered water because if you're using chlorinated water, you know what you're doing. You're actually beating the flora, microflora big time. Um, chlorine is to destruct, destruct bacteria 
reduce bacteria count in our drinking water, it's not going to avoid the bacteria in the intestinal tract. That's why it's super important for you to actually dechlorinate your drinking water yourself and your dog. Uh, use probiotics. I have formulated non-dairy canine specific probiotics that also have some other ingredients that are actually beneficial for um, giardia prevention. And I'll talk to you about that in a moment. If the diarrhea is really severe or if it doesn't stop within one day or two days, you can, or if you know that your dog just got into something really nasty, uh, you can use activated charcoal tablets. Now, I usually just give one tablet um, three times daily or twice daily with each food uh, meal, meaning that if you, if you give three meals uh, on that particular day, give three tablets. If you give two meals, give two tablets. I usually feed my dog only once a day because of the microfasting, intermittent fasting is good for dogs, okay? But if your dog is um, <laughs> princess or prince and needs to feed, um, just give them activated charcoal with every meal. Now, I don't always give activated charcoal because if your dog has diarrhea in the house on the carpet, it's much more difficult to clean. But if I know that my dog got into something really nasty or potentially toxic, or I don't know what it was, I use activated charcoal. Um, if diarrhea doesn't stop within 48 hours or your dog is listless, uh, looks dehydrated, um, that is a reason to take them to a hospital mainly for rehydration and supportive treatment. I would always be very careful using antibiotics without knowing what the pathogen is, meaning that I would take a fecal swab, I would send fecal sample to the lab as well, I would do bacterial culture. In the meantime, I would actually support the dog, I would give um, high doses of probiotics and maybe charcoal, but I would not be giving antibiotics right away because we don't really know why the diarrhea happens. Maybe it is because your dog just got into something and the body needs to purge, purge and cleanse. Think of diarrhea as a, the body's way of getting rid of something that should not be in, right? Whether it's a parasite, whether it's a toxin, whether it's something that your dog ate. Pax has a bad habit of going in the bushes. And here in Prague, they, people, I don't know, tourists just go around and <laughs> they have the urge and they go. So I try not to, I try to control it, but sometimes it doesn't happen. And believe it or not, he still is pretty solid. He gets his probiotics every day and he doesn't seem to have any issues with being indiscreet. Even though I don't like it, he doesn't think that it's a problem. And sometimes I cannot catch it, sometimes I do catch it. But yeah, I don't really know whether you have the lack of having a poop eater, but uh, nasty. Um you know, can, can I clarify one point on the slide that we were just looking at for activated charcoal? Um, mm -hmm. Would it be a maximum of 48 hours that you would give that? Um, what is the sort of timeline uh, that you would um, You know, suggest? I would use it for the first two days or so, uh, yes. yeah. for, for one or two days. Um, you know, activated charcoal is not, it's really benign on the level of uh, pharmace pharmaceutical effect. So you don't really need to worry about um, overdosing it. Uh, you know, if you have a small dog, I would usually just give one tablet. And if you have a really super large dog, you can even give two. It, it doesn't really matter. You can you cannot overdose it. Um, but yes, it's a it's a good point, Alicia. Thank you. So uh, what is next? Next is uh, what to do beside making sure your dog gets uh, fasted and making sure that your dog gets uh, well hydrated. I'm going to share another slide here. Um, I'll tell you what I use. You can create your own protocol. Uh, this is something that uh, I have formulated because I like knowing what goes in the products. I like to formulate them. It's my passion. Uh, it makes me feel good when people write good reviews and, and say that the products help. But you know, again, you have to you have to do what you need to do. Um, GutSense has prebiotics, probiotics, and it also has ginger. And ginger is not only good for digestion, but it is good for eliminating trophozoids, believe it or not. So, you know, I put the ginger in with the intention to improve digestion and also uh, prevent or making the environment of the gut slightly more hostile to giardia and other protozoa. 
Uh, feel good omega reduces inflammation. It also in, it also is important for cell repair, for cell wall repair. So if you have inflammation, if you have inflammatory bowel disease, leaky gut, or anything like that, it's super important to give omega threes. They're anti-inflammatory. They repair cells and they are necessary and essential. The body cannot make them. Some people or people often ask me, so can I give plant-based oil? Can I give fish oils? Can I give um, can I give a krill oil? You can, but there are issues with each of these and you can go on the website and go to feelgoodomega.com and look at the issues and why I chose um, feel, good, um, feel Good Omega base for from calamari. Um, there are, yeah, there, there, there are many issues from heavy metals to GMO to um, metabolites that are actually toxic and teratogenic um, in some of the other omega oils. So, you know, I feel confident about feel good omega. I take it every day. I give it to packs every day. And now there's also humankind, which is feel good omega H in the US. Canadians, forgive me. I can't really push the government any faster. Uh, they're very slow. It seems like their goal is to basically prevent um, anyone who has natural products to do business. And it's very difficult, very labor intensive, and every product has to be registered. And, uh, and the bureaucrats really take a lot of time and pleasure in delaying the process. So um, if you work for the government, please help us. <laughs> Otherwise, it may take a year, I don't know, maybe even longer. Uh, we are going to do our best, but uh, we could not really apply until the product was launched. And when the product is launched, then we can apply in Canada. Uh, the product is tested for heavy metals. Um, as I said, I use it, my family uses it, my mother uses it. Um, she's 85 and she suffers with uh, cognitive problems. So we're giving that to her. When I had a concussion and I had um, problems with my reading and vision, since I started using Feel Good Omega, it completely corrected. And the post-concussion symptoms, I really think that, that omega-3s make a huge difference. But in case of Giardia, it is important for repairing the cells. Now, there's another really cool ingredient, and it is cinnamon, and it is good for the cysts. So, you know, spices, when they were added into food in the old days, I think our ancient, our ancestors, kind of knew from experience that certain spices and certain food is really good and beneficial and medicinal. So my GRD protocol doesn't really, in the first phase, doesn't really include metronidazole. It doesn't include fenbendazole. It includes probiotics, omega, cinnamon, and ginger. And it is less expensive. I can guarantee you that these products or food ingredients will not cause um, the symptoms that I've listed with metronidazole or fenbendazole. Now, um, uh, it also supports, this protocol supports regeneration of the intestinal lining. It reduces inflammation and it improves immune function of the gut. 80% of the immune system is in the gut, you guys. And it's super important to remember that if you want to protect your dog from parasites that you have to, or infections of any kind, you have to make sure that your dog's intestinal tract is strong and the immunity is strong. So I have one more thing to mention, and that is that the primary goal of the treatment of GRDASIS should be to reduce the symptoms. Every clinical book that is actually up to date will tell up to date will tell you that the goal of therapy, whether it's conventional, non-conventional, should not be to eliminate giardia. And what happens in clinical setting in veterinary hospitals and clinics, often your dog is examined again. He doesn't have diarrhea, but parasite is present and goes on another course of antibiotics. And you're causing the damage that I've listed. And this is the big problem. So I'm not necessarily saying never use fenbendazole or metronidazole, 
but I would lose it, use it as a last resort, and I would really give it maybe one to two weeks to see if the symptoms disappear. Of course, your dog must not be dehydrated. Your dog must be well and happy and alert and bright and, and, and uh, not listless. But if you see that your dog is okay, and maybe every third or fourth day, there's a little bit of loose stool, just continue with the treatment plan. And I would actually continue with the treatment plan for one to two months if your dog is positive uh, with uh, Giardia. And after that, I would continue with the probiotics and omegas anyway, because they are part of the essential four, the fabulous four, vitamins, minerals, omega oils, and probiotics. I know that I keep repeating some of these things over and over again, but you know, good medicine is simple. And good medicine, good health care and prevention is actually simple. And I hope that if I keep repeating it, this is because this will become the norm, that you actually will know what to do when your dog is positive. You also will be able to ask the right question when your dog is positive. And it gives me tremendous pleasure to actually do this for you. Some people wonder why I do this. You know, I... I, I have a really good life and I've been very fortunate and lucky and I'm very grateful to those of you who actually trust our products that actually support this whole mission. But after you make about, they say, $17,000 a year, one has to find purpose. And if you find purpose in helping others, it just makes you feel good. It doesn't need to make necessarily money. And the money is a byproduct and doesn't really make our life happier or whatever. And money is important in the first stage where we are kind of looking for shelter, when we are looking to have money for groceries and the basic essential needs. But after that, we need to do something that makes us happy. And uh, that's why we're doing that. You know, I don't even know whether anyone buys after, after I was doing a Facebook Live but I don't really care because I know that those people who love the products and see the benefits they do and those who don't, it is okay. I still will be here for you. And Alicia will too. Alicia is actually the person behind the five-star customer service that we have. And I know that, Alicia, how do you feel about being having such good feedback from everyone? It's really heartwarming to hear such great feedback from the community, um, whether it's dog lovers that purchase our products or just dog lovers in the community that are interested in the educational information. Um, our team feels very uplifted and I definitely uh, feel happy every day that we make a difference and we appreciate the feedback for sure. Anyway, it's time for a question. Thank you, Alicia, for, for giving me the, uh, I don't know, just, just sharing your, how you feel. It's, it's actually... You know, the most frustrating part in medicine is that the same problems repeat over and over and over. And we get so many heartbreaking stories of what is being done. And I see a lot of unnecessary damage and procedures. And I'm not necessarily saying I, I, I love my colleagues and I don't want you to take it that I'm anti-vet or anti-conventional medicine. I'm anti-medicine that doesn't make sense. I'm anti-medicine that causes problems. I'm anti-medicine that actually is driven by drugs and drugs and drugs. You know, since um, <laughs> I've been just thinking how long it's been since I've taken any kind of form of medication. And I think that it's been more than 20 years. And I'm 57. And I sometimes think about how it's been going and touch wood. And then I go, shouldn't, shouldn't I be actually more stiff and more unwell <laughs> when one is 57? And, and so, yeah, it works. And that's why we've also launched the H plus line. And it, we're going to be coming with more products over the course of the next couple of months. But anyway, let's go to questions. Um, let's go to, let's, let's see if you have any, any uh, inquiries. We have some questions from the community. Um, the first one is from Belinda. Thanks for your question, Belinda. How can you avoid your dog from getting Giardia? Are there any natural supplements you can use to be proactive to avoid Giardia when you take your dog to the river or lake? And I know that we've covered this in the Facebook Live, but it's worth re-mentioning for um, folks that maybe haven't heard the, the full discussion or seen the, the full slideshow. 
You know, I think it's a really good question. I should say that I, 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 I didn't really mention it. Um, I tell you how I deal with it. I don't worry. <laughs> I actually let my dog drink from creeks and puddles if they're semi clean, you know, sometimes I can't prevent him. And I would only deal with it when I, um, when I see diarrhea, then I basically apply the diarrhea protocol. But I also know that his gut is strong. I also know that he's got regular good bowel movement and it's solid. And I, I do my little happy dance when I see a good poop. Like every dog lover loves <laughs> perfect number two. <laughs> there is a saying, every dog lover loves perfect number two. But, you know, there's obviously probiotics, obviously omegas. You can add preventive course of, uh, you know, you can add a little more ginger than what is in gut sense, but I don't think it's necessary. And you can add a little bit of cinnamon in the food. It doesn't cause any problems or side effects. But, you know, yeah, I would just deal with it if it comes, if it happens. I, I know that people worry about Giardia, but our dogs can be just fine having a few trophozoites in the gut and it actually creates good immune response. And that's how the body works. Uh, it gets in touch with a few and prevents a uh, major infection. Um, if your dog is healthy, I don't think that you need to worry. If your dog, dog's health is compromised or if your dog is on immunosuppressive drugs, then you may want to add some of the extra cinnamon and extra ginger in food on a regular basis. Um, I repeat the doses again, it's about 150 milligrams per kilogram of cinnamon. And that's the therapeutic dose for Giardia. So you can even go less, you can go half, let's say 75 or 100 milligrams per kilogram. And when it comes to ginger, um, and I'm talking dehydrated ginger, but it can also be fresh somewhere around one eighth of a teaspoon for a small dog, uh, one quarter for medium and one half of a teaspoon for a large dog. But these are doses that I use usually for an infection when I have diarrhea and when I know that uh, GRD is present. Thank you. This helps. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question is from Sean. Sean said, um, if a dog has Giardia as a puppy, do they always have it? But it just goes dormant and can flare up again. What does that look like in the life it's cycle? It's a really good question. You know, uh, puppies get Giardia more frequently when the hygiene um, uh, is a little poorer, right? When puppies are not cleaned or when the box, the whelping box in their little home house is not cleaned well. Um, Generally, the purpose of any treatment should be that the parasite goes kind of dormant and, and doesn't cause any damage to the intestinal wall. Um, but when it comes to puppies, I would actually use the same therapy, the same cure. And it is actually the goal of the therapy is to basically stop having symptoms. That's the, that's the therapy. Even if, if uh, metronidazole or fembendazole is used in the last stage when you see that nothing is helping, um, the goal is not to eliminate the parasite because these drugs are known not, not to have that complete effect. Uh, but again, I think that if you treat your puppy the way I suggested, um, it's very likely that your dog will be okay. Thank you. Some great questions coming in today. Um, Jojo asks, is it always just diarrhea or does Giardia cause vomiting as well? Um, usually not. And usually the, uh, the diarrhea is not frequent. So this, the, the, the way you recognize small bowel diarrhea is that it happens less frequently. Large bowel diarrhea happens more frequently. I don't know if you've ever traveled to developing countries or, you know, Mexico or somewhere where I've traveled to Egypt. And I knew that I had uh, large bowel diarrhea because I had to run and I had to run fast. And that happens usually with large bowel. With small bowel, it doesn't happen as frequently. But Giardia should not be causing usually any vomiting. It very rarely happens with Giardia. Um, Good to know. Thank you. I guess it's possible, but it, it's not one of the guiding symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the next question is from Nina to do with gut health in general. Do you feel dog's psychological structure has an effect on gut health? And is there a difference between, for example, a German Shepherd and a Bulldog 
in terms of the gut health and the psychological oh, absolutely. So effects first on it. I'm going to go over the emotions, okay? So um, dogs that are a little high strung and emotional or people who are more emotional have sometimes sensitive digestion. So that's definitely true. Um, it digestion is also uh, controlled by you know good good function of the digestion digestive tract is controlled by the parasympathetic and also sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the the one that actually makes um, intestinal tract more active, and the sympathetic one less active. So you know if there's a lot of stress, kind of like high adrenaline situation, people may get constipated, but sometimes they may also get diarrhea. It really is a little more complicated. Uh, but but um, when it comes to the different breeds, I'd say it's more about the anatomy of a dog that actually affects than let's say bulldog versus German shepherd. Um, the herding dogs like German shepherds or border collies or dogs that have kind of like this longer or high strung back, right? They actually jump and they leap and they do all that. The lumbar area is actually, um, it governs the intestinal tract. Um, see the spine as the energy highway and the different segments as the branches that go to the organs. And the lumbar area branches go to the intestinal tract. And if the muscles along the spine get tight or injured or the spine gets misaligned, the nerves and the nerve, nerve lines, energy lines that go to the gut get impinged. And then the gut doesn't function as well. Um, German shepherds have a lot of rear end um, myelopathy, spinal issues and back issues. They're very likely more prone to diarrhea than let's say, a Jack Russell that will have solid back, short back, you know, the little, oh, they walk. <laughs> and they're strong, right? They're muscular. Um, yeah, so definitely breed predilection, also genetic predilection. Some dogs may have more diarrhea tendency than others. My first dog, Sky, had diarrhea tendency. Pax is fine. He has had a few diarrhea bouts, you know, in his two years, maybe a couple or maybe three but it usually happens because you eat something and see diarrhea as the body's way of eliminating whatever should not be in. So using anti-diarrheal drugs right at the beginning is actually not a good idea because you are actually preventing the body doing its thing and eliminating what it should not be in. If diarrhea lasts for more than a few days, then it's a problem, right? Because we can, we can, uh, we can see dehydration, we can see, um, you know, loss of electrolytes and all that. So interesting just to really get an oversight and understand how everything's connected. And it's so cool, you guys. Yeah, it's so really interesting. It's simple as well. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it, it, well, it's not simple, but it can be made simple to deal with 80% of the problems that you're dealing with, really. Mm -hmm. And the 20%, you need to see a veterinarian, but you know, having having a dog with one day diarrhea, you know what to do. Absolutely. And the next question, um, also health related to do with diet, is from Tanya. Is it okay to start a raw diet with a senior dog? Hasn't their body adopted, or sorry, hasn't their body adapted to a kibble diet? Please explain what to expect when we first transition into a raw diet. Not every dog is the same. Mm -hmm. But what you can expect is every cell in your dog's body singing hallelujah. I mean, like, it is so fantastic in most dogs. And it's never too late. Um, it's never too late. I would start with cooked food, with some maybe cooked vegetables, and give it a week and then I would start adding raw. Also, depending on what your dog's dentition or what your dog's teeth look like, uh, you may want to be gentle with bones initially and give uh, the bones maybe after two or three weeks. Um, the recipe makers, there's a recipe maker on our site uh, that we created with passion. <laughs> it's free. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's see. Oh, I'm gonna uh, look it up and show you. 
Alicia, our recipe maker. I'm yeah, to... and um, for the community, <laughs> while that's being looked up, I know that Paula has posted a link in the chat. Um, when you go to peterdebias.com, in the very top um, menu bar, there's um, learning and educational information is available up there, as well as links to all of our free educational courses and the recipe maker. Um, Alicia, I can see that uh, if I click on the logo, it doesn't go back to the website. So we may want to make a correction, but otherwise this is the website. <laughs> so uh, diet and learning, if you click on that, uh, you can see that uh, recipe maker is right here. Um, this is Pax when he was a puppy. I made a little spread for him. And, um, you know, it explains everything. There are some courses as well on here. Just a second, I'm just gonna navigate through here. There's an explanation why raw food and it explains why we shouldn't be, you know, I've never seen a wolf or dog in the field of grain or, or corn, have you? Um, that's why we should not be feeding it to our dogs. Um, um, I am also going to, there's also a recipe maker introduction and then you can uh, just kind of go through selecting different ingredients and creating recipes. It'll tell you how to adjust your uh, dog's daily dose if, if it is heavy or if, if your dog is, uh, is too thin. Uh, there's so many different things, what to feed, what not to feed. Um, it's, it's really fantastic, actually. I, I really like it and a lot of people use it. It'll, it'll show you which vegetables you should, you should be giving the most, the green ones, and why some of them are, let's say, yellow. Uh, broccoli, for example, they say that it actually reduces the absorption of iodine, therefore we should, it's goitrogenic or hypothyroidism causing. Personally, I actually do give broccoli to packs because I've never seen hypothyroidism occur after feeding broccoli or other cruciferi. But you know, when it comes to cabbage and others, just you can be a little lighter on it. Uh, carrots, they're interesting, right? Carrots um, don't digest really well. Uh, they're really also high in sugar, so they can, um, they can affect the gastro gastrointestinal flora. Um, so you can see cilantro is actually great uh, for absorbing mercury from fruit. Um, I love dill, I like green beans, you can cook squash, uh, pumpkin, all those. And if you select whatever you want to select, um, then you go to the next step and it'll give you organs. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about organs today. Uh, you don't need to stress if you don't find organs around to add in your dog's food. If you give the fabulous four, the vitamins, minerals, omegas, and probiotics, you don't really need to worry about organs as much. I sometimes don't feed organs to packs. I just got some chicken hearts recently, but you know I may not give him organs for some time, so don't worry about it. And when it comes to bones, I usually give them separately. And again, there's a whole piece of information about what bones to feed and why not to feed bones before exercise and why not to feed your dog before exercise actually as well. So if I make, um, if I make a regular meal, usually I do meat and veggies and sometimes organs, and then I give the bones separately. And if you give the bones and if it's like ch chicken thighs or chicken carcasses or something like that, then it should replace the amount of the, the, the amount of meat and veggies that you would normally give, right? So don't give veggies and meat and plus bones because you're all gonna overfeed your dog and definitely do not exercise your dog after, after feeding at least for three hours because it would predispose them to stomach bloat. So, you know, when, when you're done, I'm not gonna add some bones here. No, uh, let's see, I don't wanna add bones. And then you can add your dog's photo and name and then print the recipe and share it with your friends. I'm gonna stop now because you can explore it yourself. Um, any other questions, Alicia? Um, one note on the recipe maker, just in terms of exploring it yourself, I highly encourage anyone that's interested in learning more about ingredients to check out the little um, information buttons, which you showed when you were displaying it, Dr. Tobias. There's so much great info in there. And I think a lot of people get very stuck in, you know, sort of like when we cook for ourselves, we might use the same recipes over and over. And when you look through all the ingredients that are listed here, it really opens your eyes up to how many great things you can um, 
switch out when you're rotating through proteins or vegetables for your dogs. Um, so please take time to check it out. Um, wealth of information. I can't say enough about it. Yeah. So just go through the little notes here. You can see mm -hmm. that uh, <laughs> there's, we kind of had a lot of fun with this. Um, you know, I'd love you to share it with others, especially those people who are on the fence mm -hmm. and, and are not sure whether to switch from kibble. You guys just remember, there are no human doctors who recommend processed food. Like we should, yeah, I, sometimes my team goes, we should write another article on a raw diet. And I go like, it's been 25 years since I started. Like, isn't, isn't that enough to, for us to just turn the page and say, hey, it makes sense, it works. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and, and be kind to yourself if you are feeding kibble, please. Like I, I do not make a difference. Like I don't want this to be an opportunity or a reason for separation or splitting up, right? Um, the group, the community. Mm -hmm. You guys have your reasons. I understand them, but I know that you love your dogs and that's why I will not stop trying to convince those of you who are feeding kibble, go to raw, go to cook because it is better. And I've seen dogs on raw diet living longer lives and I've been feeding it for 25 years. And I, you know, now when I see a middle-aged to older dog, because the young ones, you know, they kind of can run on anything. Mm -hmm. When I see middle-aged to older dog and I look at them from 30 feet, I, I recognize whether they're on kibble or, or raw food or cooked food. And raw and cooked are pretty much, you know, they're similar. Feed at least raw veggies if you feed cooked, if you're worried about bacteria. There's a lot of articles on my website also about bacteria and why you shouldn't worry because, you know, raw meat is not the worst that your dog has eaten. Let's be honest, right? <laughs> <laughs> so true. Um, we have two more questions if we can fit them in. They're diet Fair, related, which, um, which is definitely, I think, what everyone seems keen to learn more about today. Um, one is from Lily. She said, what about freeze dried? So if you could um, go from processed food, i.e. kibble and canned through to maybe freeze dried or dehydrated and then cooked and raw, how do they stack up and how would you sort of qualify best choice versus next best, et cetera? Oh, goodness. You know, freeze-dried food um, is probably okay for travel. I wouldn't recommend feeding it on a regular basis because once again, like you, even when it's freeze-dried, like you expose the nutrients such as oils and uh, other nutrients to air and they oxidize and they go rancid. Uh, and that's the biggest problem because rancid oils actually cause problems. And even if it's dehydrated, the oils are not really subject to being dehydrated and being preserved by dehydration, right? So uh, that's my biggest concern. I would say, I would say um, kibble and canned are the worst. Uh, canned because of all the plastic that is in the lining of the cans and also that is dead food. It, it has no, you know, it's overcooked at 130 degrees Celsius, which is really high. It's higher than boiling point for, for the Fahrenheit people. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't really know what 130 Fahrenheit is. I mean, Celsius is in Fahrenheit. It's Look really it hot. <laughs> it's really hot. Um, um, then I would say dehydrated, um, regular dehydrated and then freeze dried and then um, cooked and then raw. Uh, but again, you know, feeding the middle of the middle of the <laughs> way up, like de dehydrated or de freeze dehydrated. You really love your dog, you guys. It's, you know, fresh food is fresh food. Like doctors tell us, every nutritional book tells us it's full of enzymes, it's full of live vitamins. And, and um, live food is live food. The body knows the difference. Um, it, um, it does better. Definitely. And when it comes to um, added things that people put in with the meat, um, Chris has a question because she's been feeding a cooked diet um, that she said has been vet made. I'm not sure if that means her vet recommended it or she buys it and it was um, maybe manufactured with a vet's name on it, um, but it has macaroni in it. Um, it also has potatoes and rice. 
what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, you know, I, <laughs> I remember the times when I was growing up that uh, my dad was a vet, right? And um, he brought the cans of food home and we would feed our dog the cans and we would add some macaroni and just kind of make bigger volume. But we also fed raw food to our dog. So it was kind of a blend. Um, whenever I'm sure, go back to nature, meeting would dogs eat macaroni if they could? Well, you know, <laughs> I guess if they were cooked, yes. But dogs would not eat macaroni in nature. They would not graze in the field of wheat, a field of wheat for sure, or corn or any other grain. So grain is not what dogs would naturally eat, uh, with possibly the exception of the content of the gastrointestinal tract of the prey. But again, in the wild, in the past, these animals would be eating plants. They would not eat cultivated grain, right? So, and, and it, we haven't been around for long enough to actually alter the digestive tract function or anatomy of canines. So, yeah, I, I'm quite certain that those ingredients alter the microbiome in a negative way, especially white flour. You know, I myself have been able to test um, the difference between whole wheat, gra whole grain bread and whole wheat uh, bread, as opposed to white flour bread. White flour bread is absolutely delicious, but if you eat nothing but bread, try to eat white bread one time and see how you feel. You kind of feel a little bit of acidity and your saliva will taste a little differently and you might feel a little high on sugar. And the whole wheat um, bread is going to be different. But there is another issue that dogs would not, you know, we, I think that we do okay on grain for whatever reason. Um, even our dentition says that we actually can exist really well in plant-based material and food. But dogs are different and they would not choose it. Um, even though <laughs> there is one thing that I know, I'll tell you a story. I was just at the market, local market here, and I was buying something. I was buying some gluten-free desserts at the stand. And the lady had like a bin of buns under the table in a bin. And suddenly I looked down and Pax is holding a bun. He bought a bun, basically. Dogs can't resist baked goods for some reason because it smells really nice. But they would not eat grain in a field. I know that. So, you know, they will like it, but it is probably not ideal. And the final statement, whenever I'm sure, go back to nature and see what it does. So you can have a conversation with your vet. Um, I'm sure they mean well. Um, there are many opinions. It's very hot topic to talk about dog food. I know that if you get 20 people in the room, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just go with common sense. And if you, if you, if what I say resonates with you, go with it. If what I say doesn't resonate with you, don't. But you know, I, I think that I'm, I've always been really interested in nutrition, whether it's animal nutrition or human nutrition. And I've been able to be the same body weight as when I was at the university by, there's actually a really good human nutrition book, Dr. Michael Greger. I'm gonna look it up for you. <laughs> You, can, you guys can leave if you're bored. <laughs> and um, Paula can post the link. Um, he has, I think, two books out, How Not to Die and How Not to Diet. How Not to Diet so, is the one that I would recommend hmm. because um, it's going to be actually in Czech language because I am in Czech Republic right now. We're going to see my mother. mother. My sister is coming tonight and... We're going to have a family day tomorrow. Anyway, let me just share the book with you. It's an amazing book. If you don't like reading, it's quite big. Um, use the audiobook. The author is a real nerd. He is a medical doctor. He is incredible. And he has compiled everything from the last 50 plus years of nutritional research. And it is fantastic. Since I started going along with this no nonsense recommendations, huge transformation. He will tell you not to eat 
meat products, uh, smoked meats and you know sausages and all that stuff. He will tell you why. He will tell you how, why we do better on plant-based diet. He will tell you why we do better on low starch and high grain. And now we we are in human nutrition, so I'm going to stop now. But um, it's my passion as well, and I'll be probably writing some blogs and and um, share some ideas with you. Anyway, definitely. Thank done. you. Yes, that's uh, that's all we have time for today. But thank you, everyone in the community, for the questions, and thank you, Dr. Tobias, for answering them all um, along with the presentation, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. I send a brief newsletter every day, not every day, every week. That would be that would be a little too much. Every week, um, every Saturday, and we have new podcasts every one to two weeks. Um, if you like to listen, and thank you for sharing our information materials. You help us a lot, and uh, give your dog a hug for us. Take care. Bye bye.